Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for watching Productivity Talk. I'm Tad Manabe from the APO Secretariat, Tokyo, Japan, anchoring this session. Today's speed talk is about how citizens' innovative ideas could bring into public services and contributes to productivity enhancement. Along with the needs of the public sector to provide better services in a cost-effective way, citizens are playing more important role with greater impact. Now I'd like to introduce today's guest speaker, Dr. Emma Chinar from School of Strategy, Marketing and Innovation, University of Portsmouth, UK. He's a world leading expert in innovation management in public sector and actively published uh, his findings from his research, including Asia Pacific countries. Good morning, Dr. Chinar. Uh, good morning and good evening to Tokyo, Tadai san Thank you for joining the P Talk today, early in the morning. How are you in UK? Yeah, thank you very much. I am very well, and oh, I hope you are well as well. Thank you. So you previously joined a speak as a speaker in APO workshop on public service innovation and gave views around the citizen innovation for better public services. So today we are honored to share your views to broader community through PTOC. And today I would like you to address the four questions that I gave you previously. So if you are fine, I would like to ask you one by one uh, and, and for your presentation. If that's okay with you, then I'd like to move on. And sure, and thank you very much for your invitation. It's my great pleasure to present Citizen Innovations for Asian Productivity Organization. Hey, thank you very much. So my first question now is about what is innovation in public sector? So people understand what innovation means in private sector like smartphone, AI, new energy, those are uh, innovations uh, in public, uh, private sector. But some, uh, including me, are not fully clear about what does innovation mean to public sector. So could you first explain us with your views? Yeah, thank you very much for your question. And I believe it's a very valid question. Uh, to define public sector innovation, I think we should first understand innovation concepts. Innovation is a popular word and needs conceptualization. On this slide, we can see a comprehensive definition of innovation. Innovation is not a single action, but, but a total process of interrelated sub-processes. It's not just the conception of a new idea, nor the invention of a new device, nor the development of a new market. The process is all of these things acting in an integrated fashion. So if you would like to put it in mathematical terms, innovation equals theoretical conception uh, closely related to science, technical application, basically technology development, the application of science as technology, and commercial exploitation. Basically, the innovation should be successfully commercialized into the market. And if you look at the use of innovation as a term in policy circles, innovation is often associated with science and technology, but innovation is considered much more with successful commercialization. On this slide, we can see a quote by Sir Jim McDonald, president of the Royal Academy of Engineering UK. And this quote was during the discussion on UK innovation strategy 2021. And he emphasized, he underscored, the UK research base already make, made UK a science superpower, but this is not sufficient. UK needs to transfer that strength into technology, engineering, and high value manufacturing. So UK can become a superpower in science, technology, and innovation. So UK needs more commercialization to transfer this research base into the market to the consumers. When it comes to public sector innovation, within academic circles, public sector innovation is defined as a process through which new ideas, objects, and practices are created, developed, or reinvented, and which are new for the unit of adoption. This is an important part. So the idea, the implementation, should be new for the unit of adoption. And another definition, a dynamic process through which 
problems and challenges are defined, new and creative ideas are developed, and new solutions are selected and implemented. For policy circles, we have also an OECD definition. OECD underscores three dimensions. The first one is novelty. Innovations should introduce new approaches in the context where they are implemented. So implementation is very important. Innovations must be implemented. Just an idea is not sufficient to be regarded as an innovation. And finally, impact. Innovations should aim at better public value results, including efficiency, effectiveness, and user or employee satisfaction. We should also understand the different characteristics of public sector innovation. A comparison with private sector innovation could be helpful. This slide provides a comparison between private sector and public sector innovation. So in private sector, the nature of innovation is product dominant, although the service innovation has been becoming uh, popular. Historically, uh, the nature of innovation in private sector is product dominant. When it comes to public sector, because of the nature of uh, public services, the nature of innovation is service dominant. Why to innovate? is a relevant question. And for private sector, the reason is competitive advantage and survive in the business environment, usually competitive business environment. In public sector, uh, there is no competition, to be honest. And so changing needs and problems are reasons, solving problems are reasons to innovate. And the next question is, and next, next characteristics is how to innovate. Private sector has been innovating through research and development, patents, open innovation. And in public sector, uh, the, the mechanisms, how to innovate mechanisms are transfer, collaboration, and public procurement. And criteria for success is an important characteristic. In the private sector, the main criteria for success is profit, of course. And in public sector, we cannot talk about profit usually. And so public value is the criteria for success, the contribution of innovation to the public sphere. And how to measure innovation is an important point. And innovation is being measured in private sector through return on investments, R&D spending, number of patents filed. And in public sector, we usually don't have these figures and number of innovations introduced are being used in our research usually to measure innovativeness. And accountability is an important characteristic, specifically for public sector. In private sector, the firms uh, have accountability against the shareholders, but in the public sector, innovation is a risky one. So because there is accountability for the public. And the organization climate for innovation in private sector, in theory, flexible organizations can produce more innovations but in the in public sector, we are uh, operating in bureaucracies, civil servants, public managers are operating in bureaucracies. And so it's a little bit difficult to innovate. And finally, transfer of innovations, we will talk about, uh, about this concept as well. So because of the nature of patents, uh, we can say, we can propose in private sector, the transfer is restricted, but in public sector, the governments, uh, facilitate, try to facilitate extensive transfer and scaling up. I hope this has conceptualized innovation and public sector innovation today, Sasa. Thank you very much. So the table compared to private versus a public was quite interesting and informative. So now I have better understanding on the basis of innovation in public sector. So now I'd like to move to the next question. Uh, which is about what is the uh, citizen innovation and why we need it now. So could you explain how innovations are adopted in public sectors, including examples, cases? And also, could you explain why it becomes more important than used to be in the past? So I appreciate if you could share your views on these questions through with your slides. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This is also a very valid question. As the nature of public sector innovation is complex, it can include technology, collaboration, systemic change, managerial change. 
So we need to conceptualize typologies to classify innovation activities. There have been a number of typologies. Recently, Chen et al. proposed a new typology that comprises two dimensions, innovation focus, three public value creation processes of strategy, capacity, and operation, or levels we can understand, strategy level, capacity level, and operation level focus, and innovation locus, internal and external. So which basically makes six types of innovations, mission innovation, policy innovation, management innovation, partner innovation, service innovation, and citizen innovation. And in this new typology, the, I believe the most important one is the citizen import, uh, innovation because their arguments are based that there is a lack of this external conceptualization and operation level focus in the literature. So citizen innovation is a novel contribution of this new typology. Let me explain. Let's have a closer look at each type where the citizen innovation will be the final one. First, mission innovation is the introduction of a new world view, mission or purpose for the organization as a whole. And a good example could be a new world view introduced by the Finnish education system in which equality is prioritized over performance. This is a new uh, mission innovation. The second one is policy innovation. Policy innovation is the introduction to the stakeholders of new benefits and obligations for the organization as a whole to solve societal problems. And an example from the UK, from Wales, is the code of practice, which has been established by the Welsh government to support the development of more ethical supply chains to deliver contracts for the Welsh public sector and third sector organizations in receipt of public funds and only the basically businesses who comply with this code of practice can attend to public procurement tenders. And another example is emission control regulations. So London congestion charts and low emission zone and then following ultra low emission zone is an example of policy innovation. And we see such uh, innovations in many cities nowadays to tackle with uh, climate change and emission related pollution. And the third one is management innovation, the introduction of new management practice, process, structure, or technique to improve the organization's ability to further organization goals. And recent examples are adoption of artificial intelligence, AI for decision making, automated decision making in social assistance cases in Sweden and AI to assess garage credibility in annual vehicle safety MOT test by Department for Transport in the UK. So the next one is partner innovation, is the establishment of, <clears throat> sorry about that, new partnerships to improve the organization's ability to further organization goals. And a good example is from Japan, baby stations. Baby stations are developed in partnership with local shops provide essential amenities and support for parents, including diaper changing areas, nursing rooms, feeding spaces, and the local shops are providing uh, these spaces in collaboration in partnership with the local government. And the next one is service innovation, the introduction and delivery of new services to achieve organizational goals. Santander Cycles is London's self-service bike sharing scheme for, for short journeys started in 2010 and is now diffused to many cities as cycled and e uh, electric bikes. And we can feel here there is also a partnership with, with a Santander Bank with a private firm, but we should look at the core of innovation. So the innovation here is this bike sharing, a new service to the citizens, and so we can classify this as service innovation. And finally, our main innovation type today's presentation is citizen innovation. Citizen innovations aim to establish new platforms to facilitate citizen collaboration to achieve organization goals. This can be related harvesting citizen ideas as well as voluntary citizen engagement to deliver services to solve social problems. Following slides will provide examples of citizen innovations further. But for now, I can give examples such as participative budgeting, fund my community from Australia, 
so citizens can vote for the projects the government uh, the state government uh, allocated uh, budget and so citizens can vote and which decide basically which project should get the budget and the next one is fighting violence against women making Seoul a safer city for women so I will give more information about this one in the coming slides and our Singapore conversation uh, to uh, harvest citizen ideas and citizen feedback on policy and public services from Singapore uh, is an example of citizen innovation. And I will give more information on this one in the coming slides as well. So let's have a look at the examples from different parts of the world. First, Patronicity from United States. Patronicity is a crowd-granting crowd platform. The basic idea is bringing three stakeholders together, people, citizens who have ideas and projects to solve local problems, public or third sector organizations who would like to solve problems via grants, and finally, citizens, individuals, who would like to fund, uh, donate to local projects. On this platform, donators can see the project details and which organization is providing the matching grant. This is an important uh, uh, part of element of innovation, matching grants. These types of grants are conditional awards that require an organization to raise a specified amount of the grant. Organizations are required to solicit contributions of new money with the intent to increase its revenue while expanding and diversify, diversifying its support base. So this quote explains the beginning of the story of the patronicity. So far, $39 million crowdfunded, $31 million matched, and 209,000 citizens donated as patrons through a patronicity platform. And 1,917 projects have been crowd granted. So, so far this platform is successful, we can say as a citizen innovation. And other digital citizen innovations, such as Guanaku from, from South Korea, gather citizen opinion and feedback. So online Guanaku office is unique in that it's a comprehensive portal that streamlines six menus, an example from Asia. So these six menus is the menu in which citizens can apply for a meeting with the mayor, and it has been releasing relevant information. Participation at policy menu is the space for citizens to suggest policies. Citizens involved budgeting allows suggestion of budget or policy project in order to guarantee participation of citizens. And collaboration is the menu uh, for suggestion of policies to be pursued by the government, local government. At manifesto and commitment, people can see commitment by mayor and performance rate of campaign pledges at a glance and residents autonomy works as the platform to support activity of residents autonomy. Residents autonomy is the decision-making organization for residents who are authorized rights and responsibilities for resolving community issues proactively. So this is also a good example of citizen innovation, uh, basically integrated technology, but the core idea is, uh, the core novel idea is to harvest citizen opinion from different perspectives for the sake of transparency as well. Another example of citizen innovation is making Seoul a safer city for women that won UN, UN United Nations Public Service Awards in 2015. The project planned to combat sexual violence. First, Seoul recognized the need to regard sexual violence as a social issue requiring a comprehensive preventive policy device based on statistical analysis as well as citizen opinion and feedback. Second, Seoul established citizen-led human networks and on this uh, picture you can see uh, an example of these human networks. Two volunteers uh, were accompanying uh, a woman, let's say from the train station to her home, uh, networks of safety human networks of safety for women to prevent even the most invisible forms of violence. And another example is from Singapore, our Singapore conversation. It aimed to measure Singaporeans' priorities and what do they hope for the future. The uh, platform 
through the platform, 4,000 respondents were surveyed and uh, our research uh, analyzed this innovation as well and uh, Singaporean government carefully considered this feedback and tried to attempt it to integrate this feedback to, to the policies and public services. And the evidence of this is a new citizen innovation, Singapore Together. Singapore Together is a continuum of a further development of our Singapore conversation and started in 2019 to mark a shift in governance approach towards deeper partnership between Singaporeans and the government. To, so the logic is quite similar to the Patrona City. Patrona City platform is operated by a private firm, but here this is operated by the government. So the citizens can find if they would like to basically volunteer or po they can find on this platform opportunities to participate. And if they would like to basically uh, introduce a new project, if they have an innovation idea, so they can search for support, they can seek for support, find support on this platform. And having conceptualized citizen innovation, the next question is why do we need citizen innovations? So I will present you some OECD figures uh, from governance at government at a glance report uh, published by OECD. First of all, why is innovation so crucial for public sector? On this figure, you can see governments are spending nearly half of the nation production GDP. So general government expenditures amounted to 46.3% uh, of GDP on average across OECD countries in 2021. France, 59%, Greece, 57%, Italy, 57% were the countries with the largest share of government expenditures relative to GDP. In Asia, Japanese government is spending 45% of the GDP. In conclusion, innovation can make this huge spending more efficient and governments more productive. And further, multi multiple crises can undermine trust in public institutions. On this slide, we can see only 41.4% of people has high or moderately high trust in their national government. And citizen innovations can help to improve the citizen trust in public institutions. And so public participation can be made and should be made more active and effective. Only around 33% of people expect governments to adopt opinions expressed in a public consultation. They don't believe their the citizens, they don't believe their ideas will be adopted, implemented in practice. So citizen innovation can help to make public participation more active and effective. And women are still underrepresented in politics and public services. Women make up a larger share of public sector employment, nearly 59%, but around 40% of women are represented as at senior positions. So citizen innovations can help to empower women in the society further. And there are standards regulating lobbying, political finance, and conflict of interest, yet these are not always applied. This is very important for public integrity standards. In the case of lobbying in OECD countries, on average, only 38 of standard regulatory safeguards are in place, and 33% of standards are implemented in practice, and this is a very low figure. And citizen innovations focusing on transparency can facilitate the implementations of public in uh, public integrity standards in practice. And so having seen these problems, having published these problems, OECD's report suggests three sets of action built on democratic strengths such as citizen and stakeholder participation and representation, inclusion, innovation, and cooperation reinforce key governance competencies to support delivery in the context of multiple crises, and finally, protect against active threats to public trust arising from failings in public integrity and mis- or disinformation. So citizen innovations can help governments to take these actions effectively. In this sense, 
we can say South Korea has been pointed out as a good example by OECD. Korea completed citizen trust survey before other countries and identified low citizen trust. So this was just a voluntary survey, let's say, uh, conducted by South Korean government. And Korea has taken actions and implemented innovations, including citizen innovations. You can see uh, from this box from uh, the OECD publication. And as a result, Korea has achieved a better citizen trust score in the actual OECD survey. So we can conclude citizen, there is evidence that citizen innovations can work with this regard. And when it comes to research findings in different contexts, we, I have been talking about policy circles, uh, but I am a senior lecturer and researcher, so I need to basically present my findings as well and other scholars' findings as well. When it comes to research findings in different contexts, Chen et al. analyzed uh, 2010 Harvard Kennedy School innovations in American government finalists and identified only 7% of total innovations were citizen innovation. This is an early sample from 2010 and the popularity of citizen innovation has been growing since then. And our research on Singapore studied more recent years and identified an interesting trend we have analyzed two periods based on 2011 elections, and our findings revealed that citizen innovation gained significant popularity and importance in Singapore in the second period analyzed between 2013 and 2017. Finally, our another research project has analyzed innovation submitted from Thailand and South Korea between 2018 and 2021. Uh, to the United Nations Public Service Awards. And our research identified around 18% of the sustainable development goals oriented innovations were citizen innovations. And we can say this is a good figure, but we can conclude there's, conclude there's a room for more citizen innovations. So I hope uh, this has explained uh, different innovation types, citizen innovation, and why citizen innovation is important in public services, Tadaisa. Thank you very much. Thank you. So in the first part, as you mentioned, I learned uh, several innovation types in the public sector. Uh, that was very informative. And thank you for sharing with us some interesting examples from different countries, which were very good. And the second part, also I understand the reasons behind why citizen innovations are becoming more important. So I think that there are, you know, there are needs and opportunities to accelerate, uh, encourage the innovations. Maybe that's from various uh, factors like social factor, environmental factor, ecological, economical factor, political factor. There are many perspectives are really encouraging the citizen innovations. That's probably what I learned from your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so now I'd like to move to the next third question, which is about how to do this, the how to make it happen uh, in the public sector. So how uh, can public uh, sector receive the innovations idea from citizen? And more importantly, how to convert the ideas concept into reality? So I assume that the process is not that straightforward, simple, uh, uh, considering that pr a private sector, comparing to the private sector, that uh, public sector is involves more wider stakeholders and some other, you know, uh, challenging factors are there. So may I learn your view that uh, uh, how to make it happen, please? Yeah, thank you very much. This is an important question. So. Innovation transfer, I would like to put the innovation transfer at the center uh, of my answer for your question. But let's have a look at the innovation process, uh, first of all, and how it can uh, produce public value. This figure is a summary of public sector innovation process. Public sector organizations aim to solve a problem. A public entrepreneur or a policy entrepreneur initiates the process. An existing innovation is redesigned for adoption or a completely new innovation is developed. 
innovation is implemented and probably needs some modification before sustaining for the long term. During the process, innovators need to overcome a number of challenges and to collaborate with diverse stakeholders. After all these efforts, innovation can produce an impact. And this impact is related to actual outputs, such as improved efficiency, productivity, or citizen trust, as well as long-term sustainment of innovation. This is important because the innovation, the public sector organizations are investing a significant amount of resource for innovation. It should be sustained for long-term, let's say. It should be well routinized in the organization. And I think, apart from them, Transfer of innovations to other contexts or scaling up innovation to different part of the organization, different part of the uh, province, different part of the country, even international transfer is a part of this public value proposition. Because innovation, public sector innovation has a strong public value proposition. So it should contribute to the public sphere. This is another process model for innovation. The golden spiral communicates the impact and scale of innovation, as well as the number of stakeholders should grow over time. From an idea, it should be transferred to a concept, then should be tested as, at a smaller scale, and subsequently, it should be implemented successfully at a larger scale. Finally, innovation should scaling it should be scaled up and transferred to achieve systemic change so this systemic change is the basically final uh, element of public value and let's have a closer look at innovation transfer and adoption transfer of innovation in the public sector refers to the process through which new ideas, practices, or technologies developed in one part of the public sector are adopted in other parts. This could involve different departments within the same government, different levels of government, or even international transfer between governments. The success of innovation transfer in the public sector is critical to save resources and increase productivity. So there is a good practice, a successful innovation somewhere, and you can model it and transfer it to your context. This is why it can save resources. And then how about the transfer mechanisms? Transfer mechanisms can include formal agreements, collaborative projects, conferences and workshops, publications and digital platforms. And so, yeah, Asian Productivity Organization, for instance, is organizing such conferences and workshops so scholars, uh, policy experts, and civil servants, public managers can share their innovative ideas, their problems, and their innovative ideas. And so it can facilitate the transfer. And then networks and partnerships between different public sector organizations are crucial. crucial. And also here we should uh, mention policy. We should not policy transfer. This is a specific type of innovation transfer where one government adopts a policy framework or strategy that has been successful in another context. Probably you have heard this policy transfer before and it's related to, closely related to innovation transfer. If you basically transfer a policy, a novel policy from a different context. So my previous research has studied collaborative innovation processes in Italy, Japan, and Turkey, and I identified so that transfer, the uh, secret weapon of public sector, uh, was not highly exploited. There is a room basically because of that. Now I'm I'm trying to present transfer is important, so it's not well harvested. It was not well harvested. There is a room for this transfer effort. And then the next question is how to transfer citizen innovations? How can we transfer innovations successfully from other countries? Here are key steps and considerations for a successful transfer. First, before initiating, initiating the transfer, it's crucial to understand the political, social, cultural, and economic context of your country, as you have mentioned. 
This includes understanding the existing mechanisms of citizen participation, the level of digital literacy, infrastructure capabilities, and political climate, which is very important. And second, select innovations that have been act effective and could potentially be adopted. But for this one, first, you need to search innovations. And I will try to basically present you some databases in the coming slides to search and identify such relevant innovations. So, and third, assess how transferable these innovations are you have selected. This involves evaluating whether your country has the necessary technological infrastructure, legal framework, and cultural readiness to adopt similar innovations. And the fourth one, engage with local government officials, community leaders, and citizens, basically with your stakeholders in your country. Their input is invaluable in understanding local needs, challenges, and the feasibility of implementing the innovation. And adapt the innovation to suit local cultural norms and values. This might involve language translation, changing the design to suit local testers, or modifying the approach to align with local governance structures. And ensure that the transfer respects the legal framework of your country and adheres to ethical standards, particularly in terms of data privacy and citizen rights. And after this, implement a pilot project to test the adopted innovation in a small controlled environment and provide training and capacity building programs for local officials and citizens, foster partnerships between the other country and your country, such as government agencies, non-governmental organizations, and academic institutions to support the transfer process, continuously monitor the implementation process, and evaluate the outcomes. This will help identify challenges, measure the effectiveness of the innovation and guide future uh, improvements. And document and share learnings, document the process and share learnings. This can help refine the innovation transfer model and assist others looking to undertake similar initiatives. And finally, sustain and scale. Once the innovation proves successful in the pilot phase, plan for its sustainability and potential scaling. So I hope uh, this has explained a very effective way of innovation adoption. So you can search successful innovations. And so you can transfer these innovations. But of course, according to your context, you need to have some adaptation. And then uh, it can be uh, very effective and productive for public sector organizations. Tadai Sasan. OK, thank you very much. Uh the presenting the framework of innovation transfer is very uh, useful, helpful. And I'm particularly interested in the last slide that shows the innovation transfer process across countries, because uh, APO's role is to support knowledge transfer among member economies. So this is a good guidance that how APO members to transfer the uh, innovations from one to another. So this is a good guidance. Thank you very much. And. Uh, but still, uh, one of the challenges in the APO member economy is that there is not many ways to know and to learn the best practice from others. So this uh, links to my last question, the next question, which is that how can we learn from others? How can we know others? So uh, I learned uh, from you previously about the, the one data course called uh, database called OPSI. I uh, appreciate if you could share us with the uh, uh, knowledge share spaces, including OPSI, please. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. There are a number of ways, uh, as you have explained, to learn from others. Sometimes the opportunities are limited, but uh, basically this uh, inter an internet search, basically a web search can help. Attending international visits, attending national or international conferences could, uh, could good options. But I believe the easiest way to explore good practices is databases where innovators share their innovations. Uh, today, I will present you two databases. The first one is Observatory for Public Sector Innovation, which is an OECD platform. OECD has been collecting applications globally 
and the application form includes all relevant information, questions about the innovation process from the problem recognition to the outcomes and transferability of the project. And OPSI selects only 50% of the applications after an evaluation and updates the website to include most recent applications. And it's a quite user-friendly, it has a quite user-friendly interface. Basically, you can do a search according to the country, according to the innovation characteristics, according to the years. And there are many tags, uh, such as digital transformation, citizen participation. And so it could be very helpful, I believe, uh, to start a search. And the second one is United Nations Public Service Awards Application Database. I have been studying for my research. And since 2003, United Nations has awarded innovative projects globally. And since 2018, the focus has been on sustainable development goals. Similar to OPSI database, the nomination forms include rich information about the innovative case, and you can explore according to years, countries, and categories. And I can say United Nations received a significant number of innovations from Asian countries such as Singapore, Korea, Thailand, and Indonesia. And if you would like to see good practices from Asia and Pacific, it's a good platform to explore. And finally, I would like to encourage you to share your successful innovations, submit your successful innovations to these platforms. There are many benefits for your career and reputation. So now you are the innovator and you would like to share, you need to share your success, your successful innovation with others. So dissemination can attract attention from stakeholders, policymakers, and the public, increasing the visibility of the innovation. Sharing successful innovations can significantly boost the reputation of the owner. It showcases their capacity for problem solving and their commitment to improving public services. And publicizing successful innovations can attract potential partners and collaborators, other public sector entities, private organizations or NGOs might be interested in adopting the innovation or collaborating on similar projects with you. And demonstrating success in innovation can open doors for additional funding from government bodies, international organizations, and funders are more likely to invest in entities that have a proven track of record of successful innovation. And disseminating information about a successful innovation can lead to its adoption in other regions or sectors. This scaling can amplify the positive impact of the innovation, addressing similar challenges in different contexts. And sharing details about an innovation invites feedback and suggestions from a wider audience. This can provide valuable insights for refining and improving the innovation, leading to more effective and efficient public services. And public, successful public sector innovations can set new standards and best practices in the field. They can serve as benchmarks or models for other entities. And finally, recognition of successful innovation can be significant moral booster for those involved. It acknowledges their hard work and creativity, which can motivate them and others within the organization to pursue further innovative projects. So. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your questions. And probably you have other questions, but let me present my conclusions in this from this presentation. So first, we should ex accept governments need innovation, more innovation. And public, but we should acknowledge public sector innovation is multifaceted and unique, different characteristics compared to the private sector. And citizen innovation is a new innovation type, and it can solve resource problems and improve citizen trust and satisfaction. And innovation transfer is the easiest way for uh, introducing citizen innovations, but the process should be managed carefully. And you can start your innovation journey with the databases to explore successful practices. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present 
my ideas and research findings. Thank you very much for the presentations and your view. I believe uh, viewers were able to learn how important what are the value and process of realizing citizen innovation into public services. Uh, thank you for very comprehensive presentations uh, based on the questions that I gave to you. And I believe that the viewers found the information was, uh, informative and inspiring. But it is unfortunate that we are unable to receive real-time comments or the questions from viewers as this is the recording. So instead, probably before closing, I would like to give one question. So which is that, uh, is there any unique nature in Asia Pacific countries which may accelerate citizen innovation into public sector? Because uh, we are, APO is working uh, for Asian countries members. So I would like to see your view that how uh, we can bring this forward in the country. So I'd like to hear from you on this question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I have been studying countries from Asia Pacific region and uh, I have attended and engaged with civil servants, public managers uh, from different countries in your workshop organized by, by Asian productivity organization. And yeah, I believe the unique nature of the Asia Pacific region indeed offers distinct advantages that may accelerate citizen innovation in the public sector. First of all, the com community values. Many countries in the Asia Pacific region have a collectivist culture where community welfare and harmony are prioritized. This mindset encourages people to think beyond individual gains and focus on the greater good fostering a collaborative environment for citizen-led innovations in the public sector. And I, I should say, when I was reading Japanese applications to the United Nations Public Service Awards, I could feel this community spirit. Apart from that, the strong sense of community in this region often translates into robust social networks. These networks can be vital for spreading innovative ideas and practices in the public services, public organizations in itself and in the society. When individuals within a community trust and support each other, they are more likely to engage in collaborative efforts to improve public services or address societal challenges. This can lead to grassroots level innovations like citizen innovations that are well adapted to local contexts. And second important factor, success factor, I believe is high technology adoption in Asia Pacific region. Uh, we have seen in my presentation, a significant number of citizen innovations includes technological elements. So the rapid technological advancement in Asia and Pacific region can uh, facilitate this. The Asia Pacific region is well known for its rapid technological growth and adoption. This technological landscape provides citizens with access to advanced tools and platforms necessary for innovation. For instance, high in internet penetration rates and the widespread use of smartphones can allow for the easy dissemination and adoption of new digital solutions in the public sector and in the society. And a significant number of the population in Asia Pacific countries is tech savvy, which aids in the quick adoption and adaptation of new technologies for public benefits. Citizens are not only consumers of technology, but also become innovators using their skills and knowledge to develop solutions that address public sector challenges. And I believe uh, these two factors can help uh, governments in the Asia Pacific region to introduce citizen innovations to, and to engage with citizens uh, to develop and implement innovations effectively to enhance uh, productivity in the public sector and in the society. Thank you very much. So it is uh, encouraging comments to viewers from Asia Pacific region. So now we must close the session today. So Dr. Chinner, thank you so much for your presentation and the responses to the questions. So these were all informative and insightful. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much again for your invitation and collaboration today, Sasa. Thank you, I wish you further success. Okay, viewers, I'd like to thank all for viewing today. 
Hope you enjoy the session today. And we look forward to seeing you again in upcoming P-Talks. Have a good day.